All right, River Point, we are back. We're about to go ride some bulls with Cowboy Larry. You ready? Let's go do it. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we need you to learn how to do a bull wheel. Oh. That's the way you're going to do it. Oh, who's going to ride you? Which one you want to ride you? You got the technique? Not quite. Well, out of snapping post. So we bought this helmet uh, yesterday for safety. We have children to go home to. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I don't want to be first though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, who wants to ride first? Uh, you pick your steer. All right, so Bane <laughs> has just mounted up on this steer. And he's about to go. We're going to open this chute. And then he's going to come out. We're going to see how long he can stay. Eight seconds is the goal. Uh, I think you need more cowbell. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I put my feet on the, on yeah. the ring. Oh, and then when you get ready, you're going to drop your feet down. Oh, yeah. yeah. You lost the wind out of me a little bit. That was fun, though. finished up today. We've done a lot of work with you. How do you think we did? I think y'all became cowboys and cowgirls. You did a great job. Very good. Well, we've had a great time. It is Rodeo Weekend. Patrick Kelly is coming up for a great message for you. All right, enjoy your Rodeo Weekend. Yeah. How about that, huh? Brave souls out with cowboy Larry Callis. Larry's been part of our church for a long time and Quite a historical cowboy here in Fort Bend County, so I, I, they don't even let me go out there anymore. You know, I used to go out there and try to ride or something. They don't, my wife said, you're not going. You turned 50 this year. And um, so, and then it's so funny, Josh, who's our worship leader, is about as Irish as you can get. So he's the Irish cowboy. I mean, it's crazy, you know. It's just like, so I know you're listening, Josh, down in Missouri City leading worship. That was crazy, okay? And then um, Bain did great, and we did really, my assistant, Laura, is the only girl that rode. Was she great? Give Laura a big hand. <laughs> Amazing. She came back and told me she rode that. I thought she was crazy. Now, we did have an injury, quite seriously. Our middle school pastor here, Abe Matos, um, uh, separated his shoulder, y'all, on the last, so this was him in the ER, you know, right afterwards. Uh, this is him high on codeine right there. Yeah, right there. Perfect. He is stoned right there, man. He's like, hey, this is, man, this is good. Uh, this is good, brother. I love you. I think right after he said, I love you so much, Patrick, and said, I love you too, Abe. And uh, they had to snap his shoulder back in place. And I said, man, ministry's tough, brother. Yeah, so... So he's down. Y'all pray for Abe, and uh, this is why I don't go. Anyway, so if you're, if you're visiting with us, Rodeo Weekend's always big. We celebrate what's going on in the life of uh, uh, our city with the big rodeo. I know they're doing a big time down in Missouri City at Elkins High School with uh, Joshua down there and Savannah Berry and the big band down there. I know y'all are having, they're having a chili cook-off, doing things that we don't get to do, but, but I hope you have a great time. If you're visiting in Missouri City, I'd like you to go by and say hi to Scott Denton and uh, tell him you're visiting. He'd love to get to know you as well. I want to welcome those watching online. My mom always watches at riverpoint.tv, and so she always comments on my new shirts. So mom, this is it right here. Send me an email. And um, it's an uh, ugly shirt day. Anyway, so here we are, and uh, we're doing a series in Exodus. And so uh, we, I wish I had a cowboy sermon for you, but I don't. I don't. And, uh, but I have a sermon in Exodus, and so we're going to use that one, okay? And I want to remind you, if you haven't watched or been here for the last couple of weeks, just go online. You can watch those sermons for free. Love you. you can also get them back here in the bookstore, but get caught up. It's sort of in the middle of the story. It's a great, great story. And, um, uh, and, and I want to kind of remind you of the backdrop for the entire book. We're going to be coming back to this every week. But here's basically the backdrop. 
And here's the conflict. Here's why we struggle so much in our relationship with God. I really believe this is the reason why. God really wants to be in a relationship with us. And everything that he's doing in your life right now is to bring you into a closer relationship with him. I know it looks like a hard time or maybe even a blessing. But everything that's going on in your life and in my life right now is about bringing you into a better relationship with God. That's God's number one thing for you. That's his agenda. That's his hope. He wants to hang out. He wants to relate. He wants to be intimate. That's it. That is not our number one goal. Typically speaking, it is not. So where God is wanting relationship, we're typically wanting deliverance. We're wanting God to act. We're wanting God to do something we cannot do. We're wanting God to be supernatural. We're wanting God to do a miracle, to wave his wand, whatever it is, you know, that he does that makes things happen that we want to happen. Good things, not selfish things like a new car, although it'd be nice. But things that we really want, like straighten up my kids or my spouse or whatever, you know, good things, like give me a job or, 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 or we need to get healthy or God help me. God is trying to use all your circumstances into a better relationship and you and I use God oftentimes for just deliverance, provision, supernatural power. In fact, we see this a lot, God's heart. In uh, last week's talk, here's what he said. Here's how he says it. He says, to the people of Israel, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. That's it. Let's say this out loud together. Ready? I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. Now, he's talking to the Israelites here. They're in captivity for 400 years in Egypt. The last few years have been really rough. In fact, when we thought Moses and Aaron were going to help things out, they ended up really messing things up, and the Pharaoh got mad and made him make the same number of bricks each day without having straw. I mean, it was just a terrible thing. They they cried out to God. They cried out to Moses. They whined. They complained. They, they, They really cried for mercy, and it was a terrible thing. When God heard their cries, and when he did, he began to um, use this circumstance, again, God using this difficult circumstance to bring the children of Israel into a better relationship with him. Now, here's the thing. They did not have a relationship with God. I know there were God's chosen people way back when, when Abraham became the father of the Israelites or the Hebrew children. And I know there was a religious fervor with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then a guy named Joseph who brought them into Egypt. I mean, I get that. I get all that. But it was not a relationship. It was a religion. It was an ethnicity. It was, I'm God's chosen people, and that's it. Now they find themselves in captivity, and and they're finding themselves difficulty, and God wants to be their God, and he wants them to be their people, and he's causing all these things to uh, come together so that they'll depend on him and trust him and follow him because they're about to go on a journey. Now, Pharaoh, on the other hand, is, uh, thinks he's God. The Pharaoh thinks he's the almighty God. And so God's about to put 10 plagues on him to, for this purpose because he wants the people to know right here. God wants to know that it goes right here. It's right here. God, I don't have it memorized. Or Just put it out. There you go. Then you will know that there is no one in the whole land like me. That's what God is doing. He's saying, you're about to see 10 things happen over the next few months that's just going to be amazing, so you'll know there's no one in the land like me. That Pharaoh, you're not God. I am God. In fact, Pharaoh asked this question that I think we all ask during difficult times, and that is, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? I mean, really, that's what you're asking, whether you recognize it or not. When times are tough, it's like, well, I thought God was going to do this. Anytime God doesn't act the way you think he's going to act or doesn't act when you think he's going to ask, act, we question God. At least I do. And God's answering the question, who is the Lord? I'm, I'm going to do some things in your life where so you'll know there's no one like me. And that's what happens with these 10 plagues. And we saw some of them last week. We saw that the, there was a water shortage because he turned all the water into blood. There was gnats and frogs and flies, and then there was, uh, uh, they, they killed the livestock of the Egyptians, and then there was darkness. I mean, there was all kinds of things, and then the 10th plague happens. It's the plague of the Passover or the plague of death. It's the final plague. The whole time, uh, Moses and Aaron would go to the Pharaoh and say, let my people go, and Pharaoh would harden his heart and say, no. And then finally, we get to this last plague, and here's how it rolls out. God comes to Moses and, and, and tells him what's going to happen. And here's, here's what it's like. He says, uh, in the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, no. There it is. Perfect. Technology. That's good. 
Are y'all back there? <laughs> Here we go. Uh, it says, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, houses, uh, a lamb for a household. So every house is supposed to take a lamb. Look at verse 5. This is what they're supposed to do. Yet your lamb shall be without blemish. That's important. A male, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So here's what's going on. You've heard of the Passover. 3,000 years ago is when this happened. Okay, 3,000 years ago. And, and still to this day, this is what they celebrate, the Passover. And I want to explain the Passover to you because if you don't get this, you're not going to get your faith in God today. Because this is the basis for all that we believe as Christians. It really is. It's the Passover. Here's what was happening. On that 10th plague, judgment was coming to the Egyptians. And the judgment was the death angel was going to go through the land and take the firstborn of every family and the firstborn of every livestock. I mean, death is about to rain down as judgment. And God gave the Hebrews a way out. Now, as you read this story, you might think, oh my goodness, this is horrible. And it was horrible. The judgment of God was horrible. It was terrible. It was, it was tragic in so many ways. And that's how God judgment is. God judges the righteous and the unrighteous. God brings his judgment. Only God can judge. I mean, when you, when you feel judged by others, you say the phrase, who are you to judge me? Well, you can't say that to God. because, <laughs> Right? I mean, okay, that was dumb. Okay, but, that, but you get it, okay? Who are you to do? God is, and he's judging the Egyptians and this death angel. So people get hung up on this, and here's what they say. Pastor, how can a loving God cause such a tragedy to happen to innocent people? I mean, we're talking your firstborn might be a newborn baby boy. And, then, and they get judged, and that's it. And so that's the deal. And what God had the Hebrews do is so critically important for your understanding. He said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a way so judgment doesn't come into your life, but you have to do something. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a lamb, a perfectly good lamb. This is really an unusual request. This is the first time it happened. This is the first time God ever asked his people to do something like this, to do anything. Take this lamb, kill it, and take the blood of that lamb as a act of faith, and take that blood and put it on your door, doorpost, on both sides and the top post. The, and, and that is going to be a symbol of your faith. And when I see that, the angel of death will pass over your house. So this is the way out. And what we see here in the Passover land is the merits of the innocent being applied to the guilty. Now, when this angel of death passed over the Hebrews, it wasn't because the Hebrews were good or that, that, that they were even God's chosen people. It was the fact that God had provided a way out. He had provided grace. Now, obviously, that stands as the backdrop to Jesus in the New Testament. A thousand years later, Jesus shows up on the scene. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, what do they say? Behold the Lamb of God. Now to the Jewish audience, that made perfect sense. The Lamb of God. This is the perfect Lamb of God. Before Jesus was crucified, the judge uh, ordered that, uh, obviously, that, uh, that he wasn't guilty, and they declared Jesus innocent. And yet they crucified him. And we see this perfect connection between the Passover lamb and the lamb of God. The fact that in the lamb, a thousand years earlier, God said, not a bone should be broken. In Jesus, not a bone should be broken. When Jesus was crucified, it was during the twilight, during the Passover, when the Passover should be celebrated. It's, it's this idea. And the idea is this. Judgment is coming. 
Now, if you believe in God at all, not everybody does, so this may not apply to you, but if you believe in God at all, you have to believe at some level that there is a God who judges. Now, you not, may not buy this whole Jesus thing. You may not buy this relationship. You may be agnostic or atheist in, in, in certain ways, and you may be a deist and just think about God in certain ways. But let me just, if you believe in God at all, I know you have to believe that one day there is a judgment, right? And most people are pantheists, right? Pantheists are people that they just believe that one day it'll all pan out. <laughs> That's so dumb. Sorry. Um, I love that joke, though. I love it. It's caused by lots of caffeine. So most people are like, oh, it's all going to pan out. Let me tell you, this is how it's going to pan out. This is it. One day, Judgment is coming, just like when Moses said, hey, y'all, judgment is coming. I want you to do something strange. The Lord wants you to do this. Go out and sacrifice your best one-year-old uh, lamb and take that blood and put it as a symbol of your faith over your door. And when that judgment comes, you'll be passed over and you won't face the judgment. And the merits of the innocent will cover you. Judgment is coming, and, and God says to us in the New Testament, you stand already condemned. There is none righteous, not even one. And you and I, one day, the good news is that Jesus died, the innocent for the guilty, so that one day when we stand before the judgment seat of God, we're not going to be judged on our merits or our demerits. We're going to be judged on whether we had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of our life. That's it. That's the only thing that they're going to look at. And one day, you who don't believe in Jesus are going to be so shocked and you're going to say, what? I didn't know. I didn't. You did know. Just like the Hebrews knew. They, they had to do something. They had to move from religion, this ethnic identity to some belief, because they grew up in this family, to a relationship. And they had to do something. They had to go and physically do something to enter into this relationship. And it's exactly the same truth for you and for me. You have to do something. Some of you say, oh, I grew up in a Christian home. I've always believed in Jesus. I'm going to tell you, that is not going to get it done. That, that, you're not going to be able to say, look at, my, look at my Christian lineage. I had an uncle way back in the 1700s who was a pastor. All, the, all God's going to look at is your heart and whether you had the blood of Christ covering your sin. You've got to do something. You, you've got to come to a place in your life individually where you believe that Jesus died for you. This isn't about being part of a church. It's not about being getting baptized. It's not about anything else. It's about being forgiven. It's about being covered. It's about accepting grace. A lot of people say, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? Folks, we're going to hell. A loving God sends us a lifeline. His name is Jesus. That's what a loving God does. A loving God says, oh my goodness, my beloved are running off the waterfall into the depths. I'm going to send them a rope, and I'm going to say, grab the rope. Some will. Some will not. So you can shake your finger at God. I just don't believe God would send anybody to hell. You just believe whatever you want. And it'll all pan out <laughs> in the end. And you're going to go, what? And it's too late. I don't know this. This isn't my Bible. I make stuff up all the time, so check me out. But my guess is, because I know human nature, that not every Hebrew did this. It doesn't tell us that they didn't. It tells us the ones who did, that the angel of death came and passed over their house, just like God promised. But I know there were some people there like me going, oh, come on. Come on. You, you, you're telling me. Okay, let me get this right. Moses 
you know Moses got a drinking problem anyway, but you know Moses. He, he wants me to go out and kill. I only got one lamb. And, and that's a real valuable to my, to my family. Moses wants me to go kill that lamb and, and then take some bushes and, and take the blood and put it on my door. You know, I just painted my house, right? Yeah, somehow, and this is how asinine this is going to sound. Is that a cuss word? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so um, it, it just sounds so ridiculous, so foolish. You, you're telling me, you're telling me that putting some blood on my door is going to save me from the angel of death. Right. 3,000 years later, people are saying the same thing. You're telling me that a man lived 2,000 years ago, and he was God. And he, he was innocent, and he died on the cross, and he was buried, and he rose again. And you're telling me that if I'll believe that he died for my sins, that I'll have his blood pay the price for my transgressions, and I won't face that judgment. You're telling me that's how that works. Right. Sure. Sounds kind of foolish. And one day, the angel came. And people realized it was true. And I'm going to tell you, one day, you and I, in a blink of an eye, will stand before a holy God. And all of our intellectual reasoning will go out the door and there will be only one question did you grab the rope that's grace Moses did this he went to the people and he said this to them he said the Moses called the elders of Israel and gave specific instructions he said go and select the lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two door post with the blood none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning don't go outside you don't want to see this is basically for the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians and and God judges that's how he judges and when he sees the blood of the lintel and on the two doorposts the Lord will say it with me pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you. That's the truth. That's when relationship happened. Because that's when God asked the people, do something. That's when relationship happens with God today. When God says, look it, behold, my beloved son, Jesus, grab a hold of him. He died for you. You have to accept this. You have to do something. Knowing about it doesn't do you any good. When you grab a hold of that for your life, when you recognize, first of all, I'm not so good after all. You see, some of you have a real disadvantage that I didn't have. I never was good enough to even fool myself into believing that I could be good enough to go to heaven. I mean, I raised hell all through high school. I gave my parents fits. I mean, nobody would, man, he's a pretty good boy. Nobody said that about me. You know, he's a pretty good boy, isn't he? No. Do you know him? That was my mom saying that, you know? Did you know him? So I don't fool myself. I never fooled myself into believing I was good enough. And so when somebody told me that Jesus died for my sins, that he loved me and wanted to be my friend, I didn't want to be religious. I didn't want to go to church, but I wanted forgiveness. And I accepted Christ, not, not out of anything other than the fact that I was desperately in need and I recognized I was bankrupt. And I did something. I placed my faith in the blood of Christ. The Hebrews placed their faith in the blood of the Lamb. I did the same thing. And that's the only way to have a relationship with God. That's it. You can come, listen, you can come up with your own system if you want to. And that's what people do. Well, here's how I think it is He wrote it down. Well, I just don't know if that, how that works. Well, I don't believe everything in the Bible. Really? Which part? Let's do a little Bible study. Listen. Any Hebrew that didn't do what Moses told him to do suffered 
death. And God was gracious enough to give warning and give a way out. Anybody who does not believe in Jesus will suffer judgment. You either stand on your own two feet or you stand on what Jesus did for you. I ain't standing on my own two feet. I am broken and wicked. That's the way it works. And that's when relationship happens. And when relationship happens, you think after 400 years... All right, man, we got a relationship. Well, the Pharaoh relented. And the Pharaoh said, oh, please, leave. I can't take any more. The gnats were bad enough. The frogs were awful. But now this. The Pharaoh himself lost his son. It was terrible. So he he let the people go. And you think that would be the end of the story. It would be like, thank God. They're going to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land 400 years earlier that God promised to Abraham, this land that they will be prosperous. And so God takes them and begins to lead them out of Egypt and leads them. Here's how he leads them. Pharaoh let the people go, and God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. That was the closest route to Israel. For, why didn't God do that? Why did God take them the long way around? For God said, least the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. And here's the idea. They got into this relationship. Many of you have done this. Got into this relationship with Christ and began to follow him. And he doesn't take you to a direct route of where you think you should go. You have this promise idea of what prosperity looks like or what health looks like or what peace looks like. And God begins to direct you. And here's the thing we can learn from the Israelites over and over again is this. God determines our route. Now, I'm a pragmatic person. I do not like the journey. I'm a destination kind of guy. When we drive to Dallas, I'm trying to set a land speed record. My truck I got a couple years ago, I upgraded it to have a 32-gallon tank. You know I can go almost 600 miles without stopping? You don't drink many beverages when you do that, by the way. (laughs) You have a bad problem on your hands. If I want to go someplace like that, I do not take my wife. (laughs) She wants to stop. A lot. (laughs) Oh, there's a fruit stand in two miles. Man, we should stop. Oh, there's antiques up the road. Let's stop. I'm going, you want to stop? You're hungry. You want to stop and eat. Can we go through a drive-thru? No, we can't go through a drive-thru. There's a little cafe right over the street. Which <laughs> we can have some tea and some conversation. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Took me eight hours one time to drive to Dallas. <laughs> eight hours. I wanted to fly home. Here's the key. You know, listen, I'll see you in a couple days. You just make it home when you can, you know? I'm that way. I'm, I'm a destination guy. I, I want to get there. I'm pragmatic. Here's where, where are we going? Let's go. God is a journey God. He's taken you on a journey. He didn't lead them straight to the promised land through the Philistines. Why? They were not ready. They were not ready. They've been in captivity for 400 years. They're going to face the Philistines. They're pretty big people if you remember the story. And there's going to be a war that's going to break out and some fighting. They're the bullies of the land. And the, and the Hebrews weren't ready. The Israelites weren't ready for a fight. And God knew them better than they knew themselves. Take that down. That's good. God knows you better than you know yourself. We always are overconfident in our own abilities. We never assess correctly. Your golf swing's never as pretty as you think it is. Neither is your dancing. Please stop doing that. It's this idea that, oh, I know me because I'm doing, and I'm going to make it this, and here we go, and we're going to, and God knows you. And so that's why he took the, the, the Hebrews on a long way around, because he knew once they got into the land of the bullies and the Philistines started beating them up, that they would lose heart and want to go back to captivity. They would want to go back to slavery. God knew them better than they knew themselves. They weren't ready. And God's all about the journey. He's going to get you ready. That's why you're not where you think you ought to be right now. Because you're not ready.
I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I remember when the church was growing so fast. And I started reading my own press. And I thought I was ready to be the next Billy Graham. And God sent us over to a little high school named Dulles High School. And we nearly died there. It was called A Walk in the Wilderness. And God just whipped me and beat me and humbled me. And, and I'm, I'll tell you, it's the closest I ever came to quitting church, quitting ministry. And I just said, ah, oh, man, I failed so miserably here. People were, man, they were coming after me. I was a hero just months earlier. And now everybody's blaming me because I was laying off their friends. God, it was hard. And I had to get up in front of the church one day, and I said, y'all, I'm so sorry you had to go through the wilderness with me. This was all about me. God had to humble me and prepare me. I don't know what God has to hold, but as soon as I learn my lessons, we'll get out of this hell hole called Dulles High School. Some of y'all went to high school there, and you know what I'm talking about. And um, I'm sure it's a fine educational institution, but it's not a good place for church. And... Uh, and I said, I'm so sorry. I was so arrogant, so prideful. I thought I was really doing God a favor by this church business. Whew. As soon as I learned that lesson, God led us to the promised land. We built this in 2005. This June will be 10 years in this deal. We've grown a whole lot, and God always reminds me of the wilderness experience. And people might say, oh, you must be really proud. Oh, no, I've been through that. I'm not proud at all. This is nothing. <laughs> This stinks. Okay, this is awful. I had nothing to do with this. If I start, hey, they wrote an article about you. I do not want to see that. Because God's done something here, y'all. I got to be part of it, but if I hadn't gone through the wilderness to prepare my heart, I wouldn't have been able to handle the success that God brought our way. I would have still been in the fantasy that somehow I caused this to happen. And I never caused this to happen. I just showed up for what God was going to do. I don't know why God didn't give us a place in Houston sooner. I was looking back at my prayer journal in July of last year. Seven months ago, I began to look for a place to start a Houston campus. I believed and still believe this is what God wanted us to do. But I pursued one place for two and a half months. And finally, they said no. It was just didn't make any sense. Totally irrational on their behalf. I couldn't believe it. Then I looked at numerous other places. You don't know how many times. I thought I had a place. Y'all ever heard this bar called Rockefellers? Tried to get Rockefellers. No. I couldn't get Rockefellers. And then, and, then, and then we got this Houston High School for the criminal justice and law enforcement for one, one, one week. So for seven months, y'all, and I lost heart. I just said, God, why don't you just give us a, I mean, come on. You heard my crying story the other week. Come on. And then finally I realized God wants relationship and I want deliverance. I'm going to put my deliverance aside. What I want's good. That's a good thing. But I want relationship now because deliverance ain't coming. So God, I just want a better relationship with you. And that's when I got encouraged. This amazing thing happened this week. We, we signed a deal to use St. Thomas High School at the corner of Shepherd and Memorial Drive, which is ground zero for the Washington Corridor, to use that as our campus for the Houston campus, River Point West End. Now here's the amazing thing. That's a Catholic all-boys high school. <laughs> I would have never thought to ask for the Catholic school. Never. But the way it happened was, the reason we couldn't use the HISD school was because the Catholic school bought it. So when they bought it, they, they couldn't rent it to us, so I called the vice president of finance uh, for the St. Thomas High School, uh, 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 just a great lady by the name of Eve Grubb, and I said, can I come by and, and talk to you about using the Houston High School for criminal justice? She said, sure, come by. So I sat down in her office and I, and I just thought, this is it. I'm going to get, I'm going to convince her. Whoop, 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 whoop. I'm going to put the, put the Patrick chop on her. She said, I can't do anything for you, Pastor. 
there's a covenant in our loan agreement that we use partly of the $60 million purchase price. We use tax dollars and we can't have, St. Thomas cannot have religious services or theological training in that school until those bonds are paid off. There's nothing I can do. Man, I sat there, I glossed over. It's like, so much for the kung fu, you know, it's just, and I was just, man, I was just like, ugh. So we're kind of wrapping up the meeting, and she says, well, what about renting here? We don't have any bonds on our school. And I said, you know I'm Protestant, right? <laughs> and she said, so am I. And I said, oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Uh, what kind of facility do you have? I had no idea. Well, they have the Moran Fine Arts Center, which is an unbelievable facility. They have a courtyard you wouldn't believe in a place for children's ministry. She said, now I'll have to get the priest to okay this. I said, do you have to tell him I'm Protestant? <laughs> I mean, uh, we have a lot of Catholics that come. <laughs> no, okay. Just tell the priest. And, and for two and a half weeks, y'all, we've been going back and forth, and they, they said, we want to do this. And we signed it, we're signing a deal. We got this deal done finally. And we are going to be at the best possible place to do the ministry. I would have never thought to ask for the Catholic high school. Hallelujah. Yeah, isn't that good? That's so good. So if you come on a Sunday night, tr call me Father Kelly. It helps. Okay, just uh, <laughs> some of you already do, so it's okay. So but here's the idea. Here's the idea I want you to relate this. This isn't all about me. Think about your own life here for a minute. Why didn't God do that in July? It's sure have been a long seven months for me. Why did God take the long way around? I mean, it, it was there. Did God not know it was right there? It was right there the whole time. I mean, right there. I drove by it a hundred times and didn't even know it was there. Did God not know it was there? Seven months. Could it possibly be that God wanted to do something more important in me then do something for me. And all I wanted was God to do something for me. And when God figured, when I figured out what God was trying to do in me, then he did something for his church. That's a powerful thing. So what are you roadblocked on right now? Here's what God's doing. He's taking you the long way around. He's a journey kind of God. He's not a destination kind of God. He's not trying to get you there. He's not pragmatic. He's not bound by time. He never says, oh, oh we're running late. Never. I always say that. We're running late. We got to go. We got to go. God never says that. He's always right on time, and he's taking you by the hand He's taking you the long way around because he wants to do something in your life. And if you don't want that done in your life, you'll miss it. I don't know what's going to happen in Houston, but I like who I'm going with. This is a fun deal. The journey is really becoming more valuable. Maybe I'm getting old, but I love this thing. Maybe the journey could be the goal for you in your frustration of not getting what you want. Maybe God will lead you the way he's led to me, the way he led the Israelites. So here's what happens. You start a relationship by doing something, believing in the blood of Christ. And then you start following him, and he doesn't take you the shortest route possible. He's taking you on a journey. And when you do that, man, life gets good. It does not get easy, but it does get good. And that's what he wants. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for who you are. You know better than we do. So selfishly, I just will confess this for all my brothers and sisters here and in Missouri City. We just want you to act. We just want you to work. And we're reminded once again, you want intimacy. And so I pray, oh God, that you would indeed remind us over and over again that you take us a long way around because we're not ready for the thing. We overestimate our abilities. We 
don't accurately assess our deficits. But you're never wrong about us. So we are faced with this idea that you know us better than we know ourselves and that we're going to have to trust not only in what you're doing, but the timing of that. And we don't like that. So give us patience. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and wisdom in our hearts. And if you're here today, either here or watching online or at Missouri City, and you've never taken that step to believe that Jesus died for you, I don't want this day to go by without you doing that. This isn't about joining the church or getting baptized. This is about you putting that mark on the threshold of your life. And all you have to do as you pray is say a simple prayer that you mean from your heart. God, I believe. I need forgiveness, and my only hope for forgiveness is to be covered by your son's blood, Jesus, who died on the cross for all my transgressions. And I believe that is my hope today. And just like the Israelites took a step and put that blood on their doorpost, I too do that today. And believe by faith that Jesus died for me, and it's my only hope. That is the beginning of a relationship. Now you get to follow him. You move from religion to relationship when you believe that for yourself. Father, thank you for loving us even when we don't believe. Thank you for leading us even when we're not eager to follow and thank you for the route that you decide to take because it is ultimately the best for us. We do not know what's best for us. So we just pray you would continue to be our God and will continue to be your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.